This is a podcast intro with Keith Coast. Hi, I'm Keith Coast. Keith Coast, everybody. You know him from uh, uh, episode, I don't know the number, let's make him up. 22. 22, was that right? I, you know what, I'm going to hop on iTunes. And episode, it's okay, it doesn't matter. They can go look, they can go Google it. We're not going to, I'm not going to edit this, so I don't want to wait for you to find it. Okay. Keith Coast, one of my best buddies in the entire of worlds, and... Uh, Keith and his family are nomads. Is that would you consider yourself nomads? We've been called worse. Is that is that a de- derogatory thing to say nomad? No. You, no. You, I, I would say I don't know. I don't know if I should say what people say cuz then it is derogatory. Is it? Well, you live everywhere. I do. You live everywhere. You they live on the road full time. We're nomadic. We and, are. Uh, That's good. Every few months, it seems like you and I end up in the same place at the same time, mm-hmm. and that's that's happened right now. We're in, well, right now we're currently in Gardnerville, Nevada, uh, sitting on the couch at my in laws' house. Mm-hmm. This is my happy place. I love it here. It's a beautiful place. It's wonderful. I I don't want to tell many people about this place because I feel like they shouldn't come. It's but it's it's it a, is a horrible place. Today it, we drove yes. past the park and it said no dogs. <laughs> And no, and no glass bottles. No glass bottles. So you can't walk around with a glass bottle and or a dog. dog. Yeah. Or if your dog has a drinking problem. I mean, what if you what if you are against like BPA plastics? Right. And you want to go all hipster and, you, and just like have yeah, so like I can't a glass water bottle. And I just thought about like people with like with uh, service animals, right? That want to be BPA free. Yeah, that's Gardnerville, a huge. Gardnerville is not the place. That's for a you. huge demographic here in Gardnerville, Nevada. <laughs> <laughs> People who are environmentally conscious and have service animals. <laughs> I have learned that it, you that it's it's Nevada. Yes, it is not Nevada. All week long, Keith has been saying Nevada, and my wife Katie <laughs> has been correcting him. Isn't that right, Kate? Katie is nodding. She's asleep on the other couch. <laughs> She's awake enough to hear this conversation. It's late. She told me just now a story. Did you hear the story she was telling me? I did. My It's funny. My mother-in-law's sister just threw her 60th birthday party, uh, made a huge big deal about it, and <laughs> had everyone come into town, and they rented this place and had all this food, and then discovered it was her 59th birthday. <laughs> I mean... If anything says you're you're getting older, uh, that's almost proof that she deserved the party. Which brings up the point. I've always wondered often that, like, I mean, if you believe that life begins before birth, like actual okay. coming out of the womb. Yeah. I mean, if you tag an extra nine months on that. Yeah. I mean, oh. that kind of changes things. I see, yeah. I mean, because technically, like, I'm 39. Right. My birthday is in February. Right. But technically, I mean, I've been. You've already been around 40 years. Yeah. Dude, you're going to be 40. 40. How does it feel? How does that feel to be 40 and be a full-time entertainer? I think if you think about it too long, <laughs> still doing kid shows. <laughs> I think, yeah. I don't know. I, you know, it's not bad. No, it's like, it's good. When you, what are our options? What are our options? I mean, like, oh, like what are? <laughs> I thought you were the gonna. Options? I, thought, I thought you were gonna say we we have so many options, <laughs> and then you you went the opposite and said, "Come on, what else am I gonna do?" Well, I mean, like, you know, there. Some days we are about to break. You yes. think about you think <laughs> about the options, like, <laughs> like I don't know. I don't know what the options are. I literally <laughs> it's today one of those days that if you knew what the options were, you would have taken them. <laughs> my daughter a couple months ago, it was probably last year now. I don't know, it all runs together. But she's like, Dad, she goes, What's the last time you actually interviewed for a job? Right. Like a job interview. Right. And I had to think about it. <laughs> it's been like literally like seventeen years. What was it? It was like McDonald's or something? No, I think it was when I um, was interviewing with a church to oh, be yeah. on staff at a church. Wow! And I mean, like, that's and that you you know that's right. that's a really weird job interview. It, that, oh, that's yeah. like a job interviews already are weird, and when you bring the Lord into it, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it just, it's it's Katie's uh, now rolling over the other direction <laughs> because we're being too loud. Yeah, we are uh, we are recording this fantastic 
I mean, this is, I think fantastic is the way to describe this intro. This is, this is good. We're recording this fantastic intro on a new set of microphones that are portable microphones, care of Keith Coast for the podcast here for the About to Break audience. Yeah, because I bought all this equipment about a year ago to start a podcast. On my <laughs> second attempt of a podcast. So last last year, I was just about a year into the podcast, and Keith said, all right, I'm going to do this new podcast. Mm-hmm. What gear do I need? And we talked about it, and he went out and bought all the gear. And a year later, I got all the gear from <laughs> me, Keith. <laughs> and I traded him a PA because Which, uh, we're both at that point where we have equipment we don't need, and we could probably use the money more than the equipment. Mm-hmm. But then I saw what he had, and he saw what I had, and we were like, let's do a switcheroo. That's right. So don't don't I just dropped something. What was it? I don't know. It was a fall decoration. What? It's, it was a fall decoration or something. I'll what, pick it up. What later. was it, Katie? It's a candy corn. It's a plush candy corn okay. in a basket. I was, <laughs> it's, it's a plush. <laughs> this thing is going to sound so we are I not. Is it, we are not we, yet. We, we're what? fine, people. We're fine. Everything's we're just, good. It's just been a long day. It's been a long day. It's been a great week, though. Mm-hmm. Um, we have been up here. I've been doing shows at a place called The Loft in Lake Tahoe, which is just about 30 minutes away from the in-laws. And so it's been awesome. This has been kind of a mix of work and vacation. And even the work has felt like play because, I mean, you got mm-hmm. to come up to The Loft the last couple nights. It's yeah. a great venue. The entertainer's great. It's great. Oh, me? The headliner, yeah. Oh, dude, how nice of I you mean, to it say. was so really, it was so good. I actually saw it twice. Yeah, you came back tonight because I was like, <laughs> please come videotape this trick. Uh, last night, I asked him to just videotape it on his phone. <laughs> it was horrible. But Keith had a few beverages before <laughs> and uh, forgot to videotape. No, I had one. And <laughs> if you do any kind of video work, a cell phone is only so good. <laughs> yeah, so tonight... <laughs> you said sit on the back row and shoot it with your cell phone. Yeah, so, t- so tonight he comes and he brings like an entire camera rig and he had like a professional cameraman jacket on. He looks yeah. so official. He looks so official we got half off his meal tonight. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. I have he my, looks like my part vin- of the crew. I have my vintage retro Panavision yeah. jacket yeah. from a crew i found it at a thrift store it's a crew jacket someone's gonna look and be like man this guy's he's seen the world he's done some things it's the beard it is the it is the beard well i sat down uh yesterday with robert hall at the loft who is a great guy and we've been having fun with him all week last night keith and i ate our weight in sushi with robert you can't say that many times no i mean this it was what was that kate well, Melissa and yes, our wives were there as well. I, w- now I feel like I'd said the wrong thing. <laughs> no, we were there with our you, wives. Well, you made it sound like it was just me, you, and Robert eating. No, no, no. Sushi, but there no. was like seven people there all together, right? Including our lovely there, wives. Yes, but our lovely wives didn't eat all the sushi. We, I was just saying, babe, that we ate, and and it, it's a gross amount of sushi is probably the word. I don't usually leave food on the table. I'm not a wasteful person. <laughs> right. But I had to walk away. Like, yeah. It was like, I can't eat anymore. This is <laughs> this is ridiculous. It was the best sushi I've ever had in my life, though. They're, they had That crunch, what was that crunch? Tuna roll? Tuna crunch tuna, roll. Spicy tuna crunch roll. Mm-hmm. Ooh, but, they like flash fry the rice. Mm, it oh. was really good. I, but, I, but I'm not, but we're not exaggerating people when we say like... <laughs> 20, 20 plates of sushi. 20 <laughs> trays. 20 trays plates. of sushi. Like, <laughs> we, had, we had two tables, but the, if they had brought all the sushi out at once, <laughs> it wouldn't have fit on the table. <laughs> there was like five of us eating sushi, and we had it we was, had probably 40 rolls. <laughs> well, I remember about halfway through, and they wouldn't quit bringing sushi out. And at the sudden, I was like, this is not going to be cheap. Yeah. Because I was like... <laughs> I've done sushi before with, right. with Fred. Me and right. you. Yeah. Me, me and you can rack up an $80. We were yeah. in Balboa. Oh, yeah. I think it was yeah. 80 bucks. And yeah. we split it. And we're like, all right, cool, right. whatever. We don't do that often. No. But then last I night. Got, I got scared. <laughs> I was honestly, I quit eating, I think, at some point because I was like, this is <laughs> this is not good. It, it, was, it got. What does it do to you if you have too much? Well, well you, I didn't sleep very well. What, man? 
He got wait. Come warm. here quickly. You can't. People can't hear you. Come close. She said. Come close, Katie. She said, tell one, tell everyone what you've just said. Since we've gone off the rails on this intro. Uh, one guy had so much sushi that he had like worms, like things living in him. Oh no. He he got Back airports. My mind. I that's mean. airport sushi. <laughs> no, <laughs> he lives in a mountain. Are you thinking right now that you have worms, sushi worms? Worms aren't that bad. Oh. I mean... Well, worms catch fish. <laughs> Sometimes you eat fish and catch worms. <laughs> really this is the weirdest intro to this podcast that we've ever had. I mean... It's kind of my favorite one, though, so... I mean, Are you Googling now? Katie is now wide awake Googling uh, about a gentleman getting sushi worms. I've heard of that. There he is. Oh, there's a picture of him? Wait, is it just a picture? I don't know if I want to see... The- no, you're looking at him? It's an x-ray of all the worms hanging off all of his body. Oh, that's disgusting. Inside his body. How do you learn these things? <laughs> Facebook has these. <laughs> <laughs> you click on a Facebook <laughs> link. Oh, it's a video. Sushi lover. Sushi lover man's entire body left riddled with worms after eating contaminated sushi. <laughs> oh, dude, look at that. That's You anyway, know, okay. I grew up on a farm. You know, it was worms is something you just deal with. <laughs> There's pills for it. There's treatment. You know. Well, it was. I'm not th- saying I want worms. Yeah. But no, but but listen, if a couple worms is all we got after that delicious meal last night, I think they were low in cholesterol. Last night, Keith and I <laughs> were so stuffed, we were like, "We're not eating ever again." And this morning, we woke up and we're like, "Okay, maybe we just go get a little bit more sushi." <laughs> <laughs> just. <laughs> Just a little bit. Well, guys, we're now 12 minutes into an intro for a podcast. That's never happened on the show before, but... They probably already turned it off. They probably did. Hey, everybody, turn it back on. Turn If you're not listening right now, if you're, look, if you're not listening, turn it back on, because right now we have episode 92 of the podcast. 92, bro? 92. Congratulations. Thank you, Keith. I mean, I know you. We've been friends <laughs> for a long time. Yes. This is an accomplishment. This is an accomplishment. Yeah. The I'm, fact that I didn't get ADD and quit on this and do something else. Already. I mean, my first podcast made it to five episodes. Right. Or was it six? I think it was five. <laughs> I think you posted four of them. And then that was it. And then that was <laughs> and scene. <laughs> well, thank you to everyone who's tuning in. Thank you to everyone who's supporting us on Patreon. And thank you to everyone who's sharing the word about the podcast. I so appreciate it. Uh, as you know, these conversations are therapy for me and other performers, and uh, I hope that you get as much encouragement and uh, information out of these as I do. Um, you're going to hear from Robert Hall right now, everybody. You're going to love it. This guy's got so much stuff to share, and uh, I've already, you know, this week, I've done, I don't know, d- a dozen shows so far this week, and Robert has uh, almost every show had a note that I was able to take and tweak and add something to. And mm. and uh, I'm pretty excited, man. So uh, we talk a lot about collaboration and uh, the importance of that in your show. And yeah, you guys are going to love it. Sit back, relax, enjoy episode 92 of the About to Break podcast with Robert Hall. Anything else you want to add, Keith? Uh, you can pre-order the bacon book at <laughs> KeithCoast.com. It's my first book. It's a children's book about bacon. Uh, it's a shameless plug um, right now. <laughs> He's telling the truth, dude. We still, <laughs> it is a truth. For only twelve ninety nine. you can order the bacon book. That includes free shipping. It will be signed by the two authors and the illustrator. You get a free download immediately of the bacon book. That you can see it's an ebook, Taylor. And we even have... The yeah, the the book plates are gonna it's it's an amazing thing. It's awesome. It's gonna change the world. It's so awesome. that's all I have to really say. Keithcoast dot com, <laughs> the bacon book. And welcome to episode ninety two. No, I'm not a writer. Okay. Something is about to break. Hello, everybody. Welcome to About to Break. I'm your host, Taylor Hughes, and uh, I am sitting right now, this week, I'm performing at The Loft in Lake Tahoe, and I'm sitting in The Loft with the entertainment director and resident magician and all-around amazing dude, 
Robert Hall. How you doing, man? Almost didn't recognize me. <laughs> you didn't recognize the intro? I like that. It sounds so important all of a sudden. I love it, man, because the, the whole thing with this show is every week I talk to different types of entertainers and artists. So sometimes it's musicians and actors and directors. And what's fun is like you're a magician, but you were also a dancer and you're an artist. And so I think we're going to have some fun. Yeah, I'm still trying to decide what I want to be when I grow up, I guess. Don't you think we all are? I mean... If you're doing it right... That's that's kind of we were just recently at Magic Live and I joked that it feels like summer camp for adults. Like that's it's an excellent <laughs> excellent analogy of it actually. It's just trying to decide whether you're the camp kid or the counselor. <laughs> yeah. It does feel like that sometimes where you're you're like, all right, what role am I supposed yeah, to be playing? You get in this into thing? that group and you're like, okay, am I one of the adults? Am I one of the <laughs> kids? Am I the mature one? It is right. weird when you look around and you have that epiphany all of a sudden realizing, wait, when did I become the mature one? Magic's a weird group because you do have you have like the young bucks coming up that are like, I mean, no responsibility, do whatever they want, not thinking about anything. And then and then you've got the older guys who are like all like dentists and accountants during the day who you know, once a once a year they go away and buy a bunch of magic tricks and put them in a drawer. And yeah, there's that. And though at the same time, a lot of these kids coming up now, man. If I had half of their drive and conviction, and like, I mean, they're just so on point now. And you're yeah. like, wow. If I had half of that when I was your age, where would right. I be today? Kind <laughs> right. of thing. It's like because for, for 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 a lot of us, yeah. I mean, it was fun and stuff. But come on, let's be honest. We just wanted to pick up girls, right? And we just wanted to, you know, be the cool kid in school and whatnot and stuff. And it is strange though. There's a lot of there's interesting changes in dynamics. Some of these kids coming up now are almost doing it for the reasons that we grow into doing. Yeah, if that makes that's, any that sense. That is interesting. Like it's like they're jumping in earlier than we ever did. For us, it was that fun hobby. That's like okay, can I turn this fun hobby into a thing? Right and here, they're actually looking at it as a career from a young age. Like being very strategic. Yeah, how do I do this? What mind and viewing it as an art and all of that. Like you're 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 right. Like it's a really weird trip. Like I've talked to some of these younger guys, you know, and it's like man, they're looking at the way. That I never even looked at magic until I was in my 30s, you know, right. and they're like 20 years old looking at it that way, talking about game plans, business strategies, how they're networking and wanting to like <laughs> right. create their right. their demographic. And I'm yeah. like, dude, I was just trying to <laughs> clean my pass and yeah. <laughs> get a good double lift at your age. What are you doing? Right. It's it's. It's cool, but a part of it is, I think, it's stuff like this, the podcast that everybody has and all the things on YouTube and all that. I, I, there really is that interesting dynamic, I think, where, yes, sometimes it does hurt and people talk about that, but they don't talk about all the good that comes of it. Like, yeah. Stuff that we never had at our fingertips that you, they have. Right. The, and the resources not only for the, you know, learning the techniques, but even this kind of stuff, like, like workers sitting down and talking about the real stuff. When I was a kid, I didn't get that. I oh, mean, no. if you, you were had lucky, like, you were at the castle and yes. you would sit at the bar and eavesdrop on the on the workers yeah. actually having the conversations and trying to like steal nuggets from them, right. eavesdropping and things. You didn't have that. You well, yeah. it is a catch because you did have a, there. I will say there are a lot of the older magician stuff that you really have to respect because they'll go out of their way to talk to anybody. Yes, you know, I remember being. Oh my god, I was probably twenty years old. And I ran into Michael Lamar at Caesar's Magical Empire. Oh, yeah, in Vegas. Kind of thing in Vegas. And I ran into him after a show, just walking through the lobby. And I was like, dude, I just saw your show. I'm really into Matt. And he sat down. Yeah. And just like, well, here, let's sit down. Let's talk. And talk right. to me for like an hour. I was just yeah. some random kid from nowhere. He had no, he didn't know whether I was a hobbyist, whether I was serious. Stuff, right. But I had, an, I had a passion about it. And he's like, well, let's talk. And yeah, that amazes me that you do have a lot of those people in this industry still to this day that you know they were that kid and they recognize that and so they're the first that will talk to that kid yeah you know we we used to have like there would be everyone would have a story like that like i met amar and he told me this and i met so and so and he told me this and one time i was with blackstone jr and he shared this about touring and it used to all be passed in person which is why you would do like hangouts at the magic club or like get together in session with guys because it was like we couldn't go online and just search what's everything every magician's ever said about the business. <laughs> right. Exactly. And it really is, it really has, I think 
for every bad thing that everybody on the chat room stuff goes to, I really do think that there is just as much positive if we focus on those sides as opposed to yeah. the other side kind of thing. But I mean, we were just talking about that, all the <laughs> weird yeah, hostility and stuff going on <laughs> with some of these sites and things like that. For, for those of you who don't know, uh, you know, with any industry, there's like the side of the industry no one sees. There's this... There's this kind of underbelly of online chat rooms and forums and private Facebook groups where people not only share, you know, helpful things, but it does become somewhat of like a bitch fest about whatever someone's upset about or whatever, you know, this person or that person. And, and it's and it it's nasty crazy. really quick, yeah. really quick. Yeah. And personal. And yeah, it's just. It's strange that you do have that aspect of it. So I really do think, though, people have to look at the balance of, you know, but look at all these other things that we've gained from right. from all of this. And, you know, it's strange because I've got, we were talking about that, uh, Andrew, our box office yeah. star man, oh, yeah. really into magic, really enjoys magic. Uh, you know, all the magicians that that I bring through here and stuff always kind of go out of the way to kind of talk with them, show them things. stuff. But it is weird because he'll come and he'll start talking to me about things like, yeah, you know, I looked this up online. So I'm going, Dude, yeah, I had to scour magazines right. and books for years yes. to come up with that. And you just, I, I, I mentioned it Google offhand search. and you Googled it downstairs in the box office and came back 10 minutes later going, is this what you were talking yeah. about? It's like, that floors me. Yeah, it's like, crazy that like new Monica deck memorization, you can see a video on YouTube that will teach you how to do it. And, and it's teach like, you better ways probably <laughs> to do it and quicker right. ways. And th- it right. really is, it really is a golden day, I think, kind of thing and stuff. But it comes with a lot of positives and negatives. Right. And you got we got to ask ourselves, what are we doing with this? You know, it is a privilege to have access to things that most people doing this years ago never did. But what are we doing with that? Right. Are we being responsible and are we treating people properly and all that? <sighs> never. Never treat people <laughs> properly. Uh, well, man, you, so you've, you've been into magic since you were younger, but when did you, because oh, this is interesting to me because what was first for you? Was it art? Was it dance? Was it magic? What was your first? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Do you remember the first time that you got bit by like a creative artistic bug? Tell me where we my were dad, at. Where you my you dad, were growing my, up. My dad brought me home, brought home for him. Uh, he used to travel business-wise stuff, but he brought home for him a uh, stripper deck. Okay. And I remember him bringing it home. I was probably six or seven. Okay. And did it on me and pissed me off i i remember i i i spent like a good hour trying to backtrack and figure it out could figure it out and finally he let me you know hold the deck yeah and i remember i went into my room with that deck for probably half an hour yeah before i started to finally realize there was something about the deck and i couldn't quite uh, figure out what you know but i'm playing with it i'm shoveling i'm going yes this just doesn't line up right Is that? and yeah. it took me, but it was like a three hour discovery period of you know, he didn't give me instructions or anything, but me working it out on my own going, oh, wait, this side is, okay, so if I, t- oh, and then three hours later, I walked out and I did the same trick on him. And what did he I'd say? I'd like to say I did a little bit better. Though. Did he? <laughs> but uh, I added production value Like, Dad, it. you flashed. You've never heard of magic before. I'm you know, using terminology. <laughs> but uh, no, I, I, I kind of got hooked at that point. So, you know. Where did your dad get a stripper deck? <laughs> I think he went to like Vegas okay. or something and one of the Houdini shops yep. kind of thing or something yep. like that. Uh, but it came back with that. And so at that point, you know, I was also a boy scout. I was an Eagle scout, all that stuff. So they always had like the boys license things. They would have magic tricks or in the manual, there was some weird magic tricks you do. And I remember some, me and my friend would try to, you know, cut up boxes and duct tape together, like, you know, weird props kind of things and stuff. But, uh, I always was into dancing, um, my first professional gig actually at 15 was dancing. Uh, I started touring all over, all over the place at 15. Did that for about 15 years all over the world. How, how did that come? How did, how do you go about <laughs> tour? Like you're 15 years old. You start, you just start dancing in your hometown. I'm, 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 I'm part native American, born in Oklahoma and whatnot. And so I do a native American, a uh, hoop dance, which is a dance with like these 60 wooden rings kind of thing and stuff yeah. like that. And I've done, I've been doing that since I was easily, you know, 11, 12, things like that. But uh, I was doing that 
powwowing, competing, doing all that all over the country, just in powwows and whatnot. And there was this show that opened up in uh, Southern California called Wild Bill's Dinner Theater. I remember Wild Bill's. Oh, yeah. It was uh, oh, yeah. like a thousand seat theater, dinner theater. It was right next Massive. door to Medieval Times. Yep. And so Medieval Times was like the medieval, you watch the sword fight and stuff. And then Wild Bill's was, you know, we had trick rope artists uh gunslingers uh they had oh yeah um i remember being probably native dancers stuff like that i was i was young i was probably like junior high and seeing the uh the rope girl and just bonnie like, west and, oh yeah oh my goodness i seared into my memory is the wild bills yeah. rope her husband was uh <laughs> tucson big mountain who uh was the one that actually hired me oh wow. uh, he was one of the native american dancers they had a a three a troop of three native american dancers that would uh do one of the main segments in the show, and I was one of the headliners for that, doing the hoop dance and whatnot. And, and you're how old and, when you first started oh, working Wild Bill's? Fifteen. Well, that was That's the biggest crazy. joke in the world because <laughs> they had opened. They had been open for about a year, and a friend of mine. I was a sophomore in high school. Yeah. And a friend of mine wanted to take these two girls on a date there. Okay. So I called to make reservations, and as I'm making the reservations, just being completely flippant and sarcastic, I'm like, yeah, and so you guys have, like, native dancers and stuff like that, so when are those auditions? Being sarcastic right. and flippant, and they go, please hold. I'm like, yeah, bah, bah, bah. about three minutes later, the general manager comes on and says, how about tomorrow at noon? I what? Like, uh, okay. I literally ditch school the next day, take all my dance clothes and hoops and everything, go down, uh, dance for him. They offered me the job on the spot. What? Oh, yeah. And I'm like, oh, really? Seriously? Okay. Well, what are the days? What are the hours? I'm like, well, it's seven days a week. Yeah. And at that point, I'm like, well, I'm a sophomore in high school. I'm in three sports. I'm in yeah. involved in clubs and stuff. I'm going, I don't want to work seven days a week. They said, you know, we'll start you at 750 a week. And I went, I'll start yeah. tonight. Right. And I what literally, your, I literally went into say? the show that night. I had never seen the show and I went into it. You performed I without performed that seeing night the show. Without ever seeing the show, they yeah. just said, "Here's your you're doing." They basically 10 minutes said, "You're coming through here." Or... They said, "We'll give you nine minutes on this. You'll come in through that door. You'll exit through that door." He'll do. Yeah, it was it was an interesting situation. But then I was there seven days a week, at that venue. I want to say for a good twelve years. Wow. Um, through them, I also helped open a Knott's Berry Farms Indian Trails. Yeah, things like that and stuff. Uh, and then. Legends in concert bought out Wild Bills. Uh, John Stewart on that. Then I started getting gigs in uh, at like Ovations in Vegas, things like that. Started touring and traveling all with that. Did a uh, really got back into magic being at Wild Bills because they always had all the magicians there. Right, so I, was, I was working with Ed Alonzo, and Chipper Dana, Roll, Dana yep. Daniels, uh, Chris Mitchell, and all yep. that. And so those were the people that I actually became really good friends with that I would hang out with and whatnot. And so that's kind of what really got me back into that bug. And then I. I owe a lot of it to Dana. Uh, Dana at one point uh, knew I was into it and loaned me his uh, Michael Lamar Easy to Master card. Yeah, that's what got me hooked, man. Went home, <laughs> memorized every trick on that DVD in one night. Yeah. And came back the next day and I showed him like every trick on the one DVD. He's like, yeah. oh, you're serious. Oh, okay. And it was cool because it was like once I showed him I was serious, he was like, if you have any questions or you want to show me something. Or th he was really great about that. And then Chip was always my theory guy. Uh, I mean, I remember hours upon hours, him and I would be touring or traveling in the car and it would just be talking about theory and how to structure jokes or how to yeah. structure magic or how, why something works as opposed to why something doesn't work and everything. It, it really, I was so blessed because I was coming into magic from a side of not being a magician, but being a performer. But all these people were people that I didn't realize were who's who. Like, I remember at one point when I was really getting into it, Dana was like, well, I have some friends. We get together. It's called the Board of Directors. You should come hang out with us. We basically yeah. get together and just – it's a brainstorming session. Yep. I'm like, oh, okay. And so I show up, and it's funny because I had just kind of started getting into the magic, and I'm reading the magic magazine stuff. And this thing was held at, like, Nicholas Knight's house yep. or Mike Caveney's yep. house. But it was and like – Dana and Caveney, Caveney and Dana, Dana and Nicholas zone Knight's and, passing yeah. zones. Yeah, you've, uh, Gregory Wilson would be there. Yeah, it was just like a who's who, Tina Leonard all there. Yeah. And it was funny because it was this who's who, but – I was young enough to not realize that. Right. And so it was just this really weird thing of uh, later on seeing all these people and like going, so-and-so, Mike Caveney. I was going, yeah. oh, dude, that's Mike. Oh, he's he's important. Okay. he's Don't like, you, don't you like, aren't you thankful and grateful for those moments of ignorance? Oh, like, yeah. I feel I like, think, like if I knew some, if I knew some of the they things, were, cause I was, you totally I would have screwed it oh, up. Yeah, or I'm like, like throwing in my two cents stuff. It's second if I had known who they were. Right. I would have like balled up and been like, I'm just going to yes. shut up and listen. Yes, yes sir. Yes, Which sir. probably would have learned a lot more if I did. But, <laughs> but it was, yeah, I mean, it was Dana going out of his way to do that. And that's really what it comes down to. A lot of times it's these people that 
are willing to recognize in the younger people themselves. Like, right. I was once that kid. Yes. Somebody opened this door for me. Yes. I will open this door for them. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you get a lot of that. And other times I kind of feel that like some people forget that. And that's kind of sad. Like I'll, I'll see that sometimes at Magic Live or something where you see this younger kid go up to like their idol. Right. And just like, oh my God. And you could just kind of see the idol just kind of like a little over it and things. And it's, you get it because, yeah, they get it from everybody, but at the same time, it's like they were that kid at some point. Right. So it's like you kind of wish people would remember that. It's those moments make or break people's opinion of you, too. Like, oh, yeah. You know? Oh, yeah. And, I've had, and it's, it's sad because I've had a few people that have come up to me. They'll talk to, like, yeah, I tried to talk to so and so, and they were so mean. And, and there's somebody that I know personally, I'm going, oh. right. Some, and it's like you really want something probably was really going on yeah. there because so, I know that person and I know that that's not a person that would do that yep. kind of thing so a lot of times it's also that thing of not realizing that dude we all have stuff going on we all have mm -hmm. things that we're dealing with family, home things like that so but it is a really interesting conglomerate of people that we have here it is as, as this community kind of thing yeah. and it's strange because you know I was an artist you know and painter and things like that and i did body painting at the playboy mansion and whatnot and stuff so i i have this like world with all my artist friends i have this world with all my dancer friends but then i have this world with the magic and it really is such a unique melding of people in the magic community yeah and it's strange and it's weird because like a lot of the famous people aren't necessarily the best people Mm. A lot of the best people are sometimes these little uh, are these novices that aren't professionals. They're not workers, right. but they're amazing. Like you know, greatest coin guy you'd ever see, Dean Dill. You know, right. was a barber. Yeah, you know, but he also was Johnny Carson's personal teacher. So, and, but then you've got these professionals that. It was, it was, there's that funny line, and I'm trying to remember what it was, but like a professional is really good at five tricks. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, a, yeah, yeah. An amateur. Yep. Is good at. A thousand tricks. It, right. And there really is something to be said for that. Like, it, it really does throw me, you know, I used to get into that ego thing of like, well, I'm a working professional. You know? Right. I, I do this really. But then like, you know, you'll see these kids that are coming up or these guys that are doing it for fun. And you're like, dude, they can easily hold their own. Yeah. But and it's like, it's almost like we look down on them because they're not workers, but mm. it's like, you know, they're putting in the same time, if not more. Right. They're just going down a different path. And, you know, they're doing, it almost becomes weird if they're not doing it for the money, which we are. They're right. doing it for the love. Buddy, it's so encouraging to hear you say that because I feel like oftentimes we, in this business, there's so many great people. And yet there's maybe a handful of people that everyone wants to talk to. And it's like, man, if you would just listen Expand to everything. So, um, you know, you go to a magic convention and there's the five or six or seven guys or, or gals that like everyone is waiting to get a word with and talk to. And it's like, man, if you sat down at the subway and the food court and talked to some of these young guys, you might learn some things that these other guys don't know yet. Like this idea that everyone everywhere can teach you something not just oh, feeling absolutely. like you've got to go to the the people we've elevated as experts you know and not to put anything down on them i mean they're there and we've elevated they them wouldn't be there if they had it. yeah yeah but it is that thing of i i don't necessarily think that we should necessarily value people's opinions on you know right that you know it's because there are there are a lot of people in the magic community that do it for the love of it but it's not their career yeah but i've had some really fascinating conversations with you know a doctor mm -hmm. that just you know and it's funny like I, I i was in la and i went to the doctor for something and i, I was just picking something up but the doctor had a deck of cards and this thing and i picked it up and I was like, oh you like cards and, and all of a sudden he's doing this like pass and all this stuff to me and he's doing like this mnemonic setup and stuff i'm going Dude, wow! You, you work and goes. No, I just like to, you know, have something to play around with my patient stuff. But it's yeah. like I'm going. He easily put in the work that I put in. Yep. And so yeah, it is. There's a really weird dichotomy. We've got such an interesting group in mm -hmm. our profession that I don't. You don't have hobbyists that are doctors. You don't have hobbyists that are lawyers. You don't right. have. You know, it's we have this really interesting kind of group where we have this different sections and subsections, but I feel like we get awfully catty and clicky yes yeah absolutely and it's it's funny too like for years i never i never went to like magic conventions or things like that so you know you kind of get in these bubbles of you just know the people you know and you don't know other people and one of the things that has really stuck out as you and i have gotten to know each other is that it seems like you just say yes to opportunities when they come up like even you mentioned like 
painting at the Playboy Mansion, you know, oh, that, that was a fluke. That as totally well. like, it, or or <laughs> the fact that, like you said, when are the auditions as a joke? And they said tomorrow. You could have not done that. I could, okay. but and here's the thing: I, a lot of people will be the first. Actually, Chip Chip Chipper made me feel really good about this because I brought that up. Like I've been very lucky in my life. Like yeah. every job that I've had, I've never really looked for work. I've had I've been one of those weird people that like as a contract's ending, something just like oh you're about to be done. Well, we're about to do this over here, right. and so I've kind of fell into everything. And I mean, when Chip brought me up here to uh, be in his show, the Chip Little Experience, up here at one of the casinos. Um, the producer was also the entertainment director at Caesars mm -hmm. and then found out about the body paying. So he's like, dude, well, you're doing the show. The show's end at like 930. We're opening up these two brand new nightclubs. You want to come over and body paint in them when the show's let out kind of thing. And then that spend into me ending up taking over the nightlife entertainment for the casinos and stuff and mm -hmm. running all of that and it just everything. And then he's the one actually that opened up the loft now. Yeah. And so he knew I did the magic because dude, we're opening up this. You want to come and help us, uh, run this and, and, and perform here and whatnot. So it, I really have been lucky, but Chip was the one that brought it up to me that, yes, I'm very lucky, but I always had done the work to put myself in the position that when those opportunities arise, yes. oh yeah, I jump on them. I say yes. Right. And because of the work and the time and the, and the effort and stuff that I put in beforehand, I was always, yeah able to succeed because of that if that makes sense oh yeah if, at, it wasn't, if it wasn't at 15 like, they give you the audition and you can't dance you're not going to get the opportunity right. you know, but and so for a long time i felt like i was just really lucky and it was chip that kind of changed my perspective like it wasn't really luck it was more of you had done the work that when those opportunities opened right you were ready to jump on them and take them and i think there's something really to be said about that absolutely you know, that if you are willing to put in the work and things like that it's not necessarily luck. It's just when those opportunities arise, you don't start second guessing mm -hmm. things. You're like, oh wait, if I if I, okay, if there's an audition in two days. If I practice for 24 hours straight, I can. No, you put in the work right. now, and that way, when you hear those random like, hey, there's an audition in two hours over here, you don't have to worry. You're like, I've done the work. I can yeah. go over here and do this. If I get it, I get it. If I don't, I don't. But it's that weird thing of setting yourself up for that. Yeah, there's, there's success. There's been moments in my life where I've experienced that, and then there's the other side I've experienced where a killer opportunity comes up, but I didn't, I wasn't prepared for it, and I right. knew I'm like, it's not worth even like this is not. I haven't done the work I need to do to be able to pull this off, you know. And so it is that thing because I think a lot of guys will say, well, it's all about getting out there and networking and all of this, and then other guys will be like, no, it's all about sitting in your room and rehearsing. It is a mix of the I two. I think there is a very, very good balance between the two. Yes, you have to put yourself out there. Yes, you have to be open to the opportunities. But if you're open to the opportunities and you haven't put in the work when they do come, right, you're not done. going to get right the benefit of it, if that makes sense. Oh, it totally makes yeah. sense. It totally makes sense. So now, you know, you one of the things that you say when you open the show here is you say, I'm the resident magician. For people who haven't heard of the loft or visited the loft what does that mean it means i get flack from john armstrong for saying the words <laughs> resident magician <laughs> really oh i i mentioned that at some point a few years back he's like oh another one of them resident magicians or something like that which <laughs> well john was the resident magician at disney world or something well, at one point, at one right? point yeah. yeah and so well no it's a lot of people tend to i guess use the term to try to elevate and stuff but you know, like I had a residency at some of the casinos around here where it was one or two days a week. Uh, right. Residency here at the Loft, Resident Magician, means I'm literally here seven days a week. Yeah. I've had five days off in <laughs> two and a half years, and those were for Magic Lives. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, no, I'm here seven days a week. Uh, half the time I'm in the theater doing my show. Yep. Uh, Fridays, Saturdays, I do the adult shows here that we've put on, the Magic After Darks. But then on the weeks when... We have other performers up, like uh, you're here this week. Joel's following you uh, yep. for a few weeks. We just had Farrell and T2 in. Uh, when the other magicians are up here, I open the show, 10, 15 minutes up at the top, open the show, warm up the audience, introduce the show, and then uh, do close-up magic sleight of hand just around the restaurant, the bars, the decks and patios and whatnot, and just kind of manage the theater. Also make sure everything runs smoothly, but make sure people are having a good time and things like that. And then I, you know... If I'm not in the theater, I get to kind of relax and turn my brain off and do close-up magic, which is my passion. I yeah. got my start doing that. I love close-up sleight of hand. So it's nice to get out of the theater and actually be able to do things like that. And Plus, I'm in that weird luxury where, you know, booking the theater, <laughs> it's that thing of it really does become, okay, who do I want to play with for right. a week or two? You know? <laughs> right. who, who, who do I miss? You know, who, yeah. who, who, who do I want to hang out with? Who, who's going to go 
you know, eat sushi with me right. kind of thing and stuff. And so it's fun because, you know, I work seven days a week, so I don't get to visit my friends. So instead, a lot of my friends I get to bring up to visit me, which yeah. is a nice kind of luxury. It's the best, man. Yeah. Well, and it's great too for, like for me being up here, it's great because usually you're in your in a hotel room by yourself and then you do the gig for 45 minutes and you spend two days getting there and getting back and it's it can be very lonely when you're traveling performing right so to be able to like yeah come and do a show and then get to hang or like we went and grabbed sushi the other night and first of all it was the best sushi i've ever <laughs> had in my life i yes. had things there i've never had anywhere else i don't even know if i went back there I, which i think we're going back tonight oh, right we're going back tonight <laughs> absolutely no. i don't i don't even know how to order i just i came in a little bit after uh, bobby and he had ordered this they just kept bringing amazing things. <laughs> oh yeah, no, that's that's pretty much part of the standard welcome at the loft here. Uh, Chipper T two Joel, yeah, two yeah. three four nights a week we're down there eating sushi. It's oh, called it's incredible. Naked Fish. It's amazing. It's but, incredible. Yeah. But yeah, it is. It is. I mean, it, this is a wonderful. We'll talk more about the place. It's a wonderful place to work. But well, it's also like the castle. About, like, you know, you got a nice. You know, anywhere from a week to three week kind of run. Uh, Ten shows minimum a week. You know that you can if you're wanting to work on new material and stuff. I mean, you've right. got that nightly, you know, try it out, what doesn't work, fix yep. it overnight, play with it the next day kind of thing. Kind of like what a lot of the magicians use the castle for. Right. You really can clean uh, and polish, you know, that's that's what Chipper uses up here for. You know? Right. He brings up here, he's like, I got one or two new things. I, You know, you don't want to necessarily break in something on a $10,000 corporate gig, but, you know, right. you come up here, you've got a full hour show, you know, it's really easy to take that one piece that you're playing with, put it in the middle between two other pieces and say, I'm going to use this week to really flush this piece out. Yep. And that's a really nice luxury to have here. It's huge, man. And for, I mean, like most of my work is corporate entertainment, which means that every show is different. I don't get to do the same set or the same amount of time. Like and every show is important with those corporate. And shows. every show really is critical. So it. it's like, oh man, I can't, you know, I can't risk like th this one. Trying this, something. Yes, exactly. Experimenting. But like I loved, you know, night one, we talked afterward and I'm like, give me the notes. You gave me some notes and I'm like so excited waking up the next day going, I get to try those tonight. And you did. And, and, and then that last, was really cool. And then yeah. last night, man, we, we talked after the show and, and you had some other killer ideas and I cannot freaking wait. I mean, we're like. 30 minutes from showtime and we get to do it again and go, okay, what, let's, let's try these things and these tweaks. It's just a, it's a thing we don't get to do very often except for at the castle or here. And right. And having those venues that you can do those multiple show stuff, it really is something nice to have. And that's also one of the things that you and I have talked about that I enjoy doing. My favorite thing is having you or Joel or somebody come in and go like, okay, I've got this piece. I'm playing with. I'm trying to figure out. It's like, dude, let's play with it. Let's, right. let's, let's work, you know, cause that's, that's my favorite part. Oh yeah. My favorite part's not even the performing. I love the brainstorming and the trying to solve problems. Yes. That used to be my favorite thing in the world with Chip is he, you know, hit me up like, okay, I want to do this. <laughs> Go figure out Go three figure ways out to do it, it yeah. and come back and let me know what you come up with kind of thing. Oh, like, yeah. I love that. That, and, that is the, I mean, that's the thing that got us all excited about this in the first place was thinking about possibilities and what could you do with this or this routine? What could it feel like or be like, or what moment could you create? Well, it's interesting because I actually have a TEDx talk that I uh, do. Uh, and it kind of goes into that about how you should look at the world more like a magician looks at the world because oh, we great. have a really interesting way of looking at things. Like, you know, most people in a business or something like this, like, okay, how do I do this? Or what am I going to do? Can I, can I do this kind of thing? Magicians, we come at every problem completely backwards. Yeah. Uh, my, my example would be like Copperfield. He didn't say, okay, what am I going to do in the show? He basically started it going, okay, I'm going to make the Statue of Liberty vanish. <laughs> right. That is the most absurd <laughs> right. thought I have ever heard in my life. But he didn't go, how do I do it? Right. He just started off going, okay, we're going to vanish the Statue of Liberty. <laughs> what do I need to do? To make this possible or work. Yeah. And that's a really backwards way of thinking that most people don't think. When you're in an office or something like that, it's like, okay, we need to save money. Is there a way we can do this? Or way? Yeah, but you look at it as, is it possible? And right. magicians don't look at things that nothing we do is possible. Right. Well, so it's basically deciding, okay, this is what I'm going to do. How can I cheat to do it? Right. It's a really backwards that way is, of thinking. Well, in business – Everything is kind of – people are aware of what their limitations are. They right. know this is the box we have to work in. And magicians, by very nature, it's – there are no limitations. Things can fly. Things can disappear. Things can get destroyed and restored. So – You literally do. Ask yourself, what am I going to do? You don't ask yourself, how do I do it? It's, yeah. What, what do I want to happen? Right. You come up with this effect. You're like, oh, you know what would be great is if while we're talking, this microphone, they both – 
float it up, switch places, and float it down. Right. We don't say how to do it. We just say, right. okay, that's going to be cool. Right. Okay, now how do I do it? Yeah. What, you, I, what I love is as you're weird. saying that, I'm sure both of us are going, okay, there's, well, you can do you this. Do this and if you do that, <laughs> yeah, no. But the weird part about it is once you decide this is what I'm going to do, now when you say, how do I do it? It's a foregone conclusion. Yeah. You're, you're not saying, you know, is it possible to do it? You're like, okay, that's what I'm going to do. So how do I do this? What's the yes. best way? And it's a really, I don't think people understand what a powerful shift that uh-huh. is like just in a thought process of going from can I do this to how do I do this? Yes. And it really is something that we have that other jobs and people don't necessarily have except those upper echelons. If you actually look at some of those really, really, you know, high end pe- your Steve Jobs, your Buffett, things like that, I think that they tend to look at things more along those lines of, okay, I'm going to do this. I just need, yeah. to, I just need to figure out how. It's never a can I. It's a just how. That's fascinating. You know, there, we talked about there being a lot of hobbyists who are very successful in other fields. Very successful. And I, I've never heard anyone talk about what you're bringing up here. It'd be very interesting to see, to talk to some of those guys who have become very successful in their industry that's not magic and find out what role their study and practice of magic played into their success that's elsewhere. Actually, that actually you know would I mean? be a really interesting thing because I really do think, and what is it? I think it was like Bannon, right? It Wasn't he a really successful mm-hmm. lawyer? Yeah. Um, there's a few of them and stuff like that. And you really got to actually, you know, some of these people that have these dual careers also were very, very successful. Right. Oh, you know, yeah. And part of it, I really do think is, I think magic really does kind of shift the way you look at things. Mm. And if you can somehow switch that into your life in other ways, I, I think that would be just a powerful shift that you could make. Oh, absolutely. You know, because there's a lot of people that are doing other jobs, even if they're trying to get into the magic. Yeah. But even when you're doing that, it's, it's just a weird thing to try to shift. Like, I amaze myself how when I'm in a magic mode, mm-hmm. I, I really do. It's like anything yeah. possible. It's like, okay, I'm going to do this in my show. I just need to yeah. figure out how right. it's going to happen. Right. But in life, you'll be like, oh, I wonder if I could do this. It's strange to think that, like, how you can be so confident in one side and not in the other. It's mm-hmm. like you really need to figure out how to shift that. And so that's what, what one of those talks was all about and things like that's that. That's really, really cool. interesting. Uh, that's really cool, man. You got my wheel spinning on that. There you go. Now you got a new TED talk. I know. To and <laughs> I'll just work it all yeah, out. And... Got more stuff to think about. <laughs> yeah, there you go. But it, it's been so fun this week, man. I'm excited. We'll be back next month. We get to eat more sushi together. Yeah. Got Joel <laughs> in for a few weeks, and then you're back after right after that. And... If you have not been out to visit the loft and to come see uh, Robert's show or come see some of the other shows they put in here, this this space. You know, when 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 I first heard about it, Chip told me about it, and he's like, "Man, it's they modeled it after the parlor, but it's uh, it's got a like it's just got a killer feel to it. There's a weird energy to it, yeah. yeah. And I and I was able to see Chip's show in here, and I've seen uh, I've seen your show in here, and uh, the both shows that you do, I got was able to catch. Oh, it's and the then Utah show, yeah, yeah, and then uh, but then performing in here, this is a special room, like it feels very different. It's it, it is like the perfect place to do magic. It really is, and you know, I, they part of it I think was structured and built in, and part of it they kind of lucked into. Right. Uh, just the intimacy of it, the way, you know, the raking and everything like that. There's not a bad seat. It's a hundred and seven seat theater, but well, and know. it has. I mean, the ceilings are high, which generally is not in a small theater like right. this. Yeah, it's got this vaulted. They got a twenty five thousand dollars chandelier up there. That they got like for three thousand dollars, but what they didn't realize is when they got it for three thousand, it was because it was in twenty five thousand pieces. <laughs> yeah, so they literally when we opened, man, they had somebody having to string that thing down here together, one oh my one, one uh, crystal at a time. Yeah, man, that's, that's a job I don't oh, want. Oh yeah, <laughs> that's incredible, man. Well, if you haven't been out, you got to come out. You got to come see some shows up here. Tell people how they can get a hold of you or see what you're doing or follow you. Do you do? I, I mean, I know. Oh, do you do the, do you, just, do you, just make, I know make, you're on make s- me show how bad my social game well, is. Well, no, but I mean, I, li- I, lo- I love that you use social media socially. <laughs> yes, <laughs> like, yes, you yes. You use it for I, its intended I, purpose, I, I'm not, not just a networking like, social guy. That's one thing I really do got to admit, though. People like uh, Joel Ward, T2, and them, man, they've mastered that social media yeah. stuff, and they're always lecturing me on it, and it's something <laughs> I really need to get better on. But no, uh, website, roberthallmagic.com. You can find the loft, uh, the loft. Lake Tahoe, uh, or Magic Fusion is the name of the show. Um, Facebook, it would just be Robert Hall. Instagram, Robert Hall Magic. But yeah, I'm awesome. all over there. Or, you know, what I tell people is just cyber stalk me through my friends. You, Chip, right, Joel, right. people like that. Yeah. Find me through them. It's so fun, man. 
Well, I, I so appreciate you taking the time to, to talk and uh, I'm so excited about the things that you shared on here. I hope that as people are listening, they're taking notes and, and starting. I mean, that's one thing, just like we talked about in the show, like you take notes and you try things out and, and you, you talked about having this rule of trying something out twice, well, right? Like my rule is, is when I get notes, I'm, I am very passionate about notes. Anytime somebody from the industry, any industry, if yeah. they're a performer, right. you know, and they come watch my show nine times out of 10, I hand them a notebook with a pen and I say, <laughs> don't write anything nice. Yeah. I got, that doesn't help me. Yeah. You know, it's sweet if you like the show, but I want constructive stuff. Yeah. Anything, you know, just anything constructive. And the one thing, uh, Tony Clark kind of got into my head and stuff is, you know, when you do get those advice from people, too often we discount it or count it. Like we look at them and we're like, okay, I'll take it. Or I won't, depending on it, like, I don't know, this doesn't fit me. He kind of really put it in my head, you know, you know, when people give you the advice, give it the respect of, you know, try it. Right. Just to see, they might see something you don't see and stuff. And so when somebody does it, and I also am the first to say that, you know, you'll have a show where something works and then it doesn't work the next. So I always, if I get a note, I'll try to talk, try it in two or three shows. Yeah. And within that time frame, I'll know if it fits my character, if it works, if right. it improves or it doesn't. And there'll be times where I'm like, this is, this is a dumb note. It's not going to work. And then I do it. I'm like, huh, I kind of got a better reaction and I won't know why, but like, right. there's something that they're saying that I'm not seeing. So I'm going to stick with it. Yeah. And Matt Marcy, actually, uh, we were talking about this when he was on Penn and Teller's Fullest, brought right. that up. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, he, after his dress rehearsal, got a few notes from one of the directors and none of them were magic related. They were just n like really specific notes. Like when you say this word, touch your temple right. or, or just take this kinda, word yeah. out of that sentence kind of thing. And when he said it at first, Matt was like, well, you know, they don't really kind of fit. I don't know and stuff. But then Matt was like, well, you know, they're not magic notes and he's the director. So I'll try them out. And, it, and Matt was like, and it was weird because every note yeah. hit and nailed. He was like every one of them to the point where you realize some people see things that you don't see. And a lot of these things are our babies and we don't see right. the most obvious little, like a lot of the notes that I give performers and stuff and they'll come back and say like, Oh my God, that was so good. So good. It had nothing to do with me necessarily being more in tune or so. It's just, you know, you get so caught up in what you're doing yep. that you don't necessarily see it from the outside. That's something that was obvious to me. They're like, Oh my God, you're right. That's obvious. Right. But you're so caught up in your motions, in your tricks and your things that you don't necessarily see that. And I've had that happen to me where, you know, I've had a, I had one note that was given to me that as soon as it was given to me, it was just, you almost want to just slap yourself. You're like, Oh my God, why did <laughs> right, I not? Right. Why, why was that so, not the most obvious so thing obvious, in the world yeah. to me? You know, and every once in a while, like chip or Joel will say something like that to me and they'll say something. And I'll just be like, Oh my God. Yeah. You're so right. Uh, like, it's almost so obvious that you almost so feel good. like an idiot yeah. kind of thing and stuff. But that's the thing is we're so close to a lot of our stuff that we don't see it. So when people are giving constructive criticism, you know, I'm all about it. Yeah. I, 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 it does nothing to make me, even if it's not something I can use, them giving it to me makes me look at it and go like, okay, well, that would change that. Okay, yep. I don't like if that works. But it's made me look at it in a different way to where maybe I'm also going like, okay, well, maybe I'm just not being obvious in what I'm saying here because they saw that and that's yeah. not what I, And so it makes me look at things a different way and maybe change. Maybe I don't use their note, but it leads to something that makes it better on my end because I'm going, okay, I need to make this more obvious than right. obviously. Well, and there's something about applying notes that it's not only the note you got, but but there's something about just putting something else new because someone said try this or turn it this way. It gets you more you're you're present into something that you've been on autopilot on. Right. And then you start thinking like when you turn it, maybe it's turned you in a different direction, going, Well, if he's seeing that and I did that, well, if he wants me to do that, what if I even went further and right. I actually did this kind of thing? Yeah. And stuff like that. And and a lot of them it's not like the rocket science or brilliance. A lot of them are just really weird little nuanced things that we yeah. don't even realize we do it's so good collaboration man it's huge really and this is. goes back to you know we talked about how cool it is that kids can get access to to hearing other people talk about magic but right there is nothing like sitting down with a fellow magician or other performer or even just a friend of yours who is into what you're doing and and having that one-on-one -on -one feedback Oh yeah, it's one thing to master, you know, easy to master card miracles. It's another thing for you to sit down with the MR and him to talk about something you're working on and how it might help. And well, that, and also one thing that I used to do, and I don't think a lot of people do this, is I'm really fascinated at why things work. Mm. Like, why does that joke? You know, that's why Chip's great to me. I'm like, why is that joke funny? And he can really kind of break things down, like why it works and stuff, yeah. or different people like that. But one of my favorite things is I would go up to performers and and really ask them, why do you 
why do you do that trick? Or, yeah. or why did you put that trick there? Yeah, or why, yeah, yeah, why yeah. that's not your strongest trick, but you did this. Or why did you, you know, because they'll tell you what they're thinking, you know, if they're open right. about it. And it's amazing what you'll learn from that. Uh, one of the examples is uh, we had Jonathan Neal mm -hmm. up here. Yep. Jonathan Neal and Leanne. And he ended with uh, Silks Out of Mouth, mm. which is a... It's a small trick, and he's got like two or three tricks he does right before. They play they're really much big. big. Yeah, yeah, they're yeah. really big playing tricks, and they're really strong tricks. And I was like, I'm really curious why you chose to finish with that trick when the trick you did right before it was so much stronger and gets. And, yeah. and, so, and what he was, and his explanation was brilliant. He's going because those tricks are about the props, they're about you know the stage and their mm -hmm. biggest stuff. He goes, when I'm finishing the show and I'm my finale, silks from mouth takes place in one square foot at my face right the it's entire memorable. routine is within a square foot of my face and it's all about me everybody's focused on me and my face my entire finale is me mm. and it was one of those things that was a really big eye-opening epiphany for me and made me restructure a lot of the things in my show because i'm going wow that that's why my finale isn't as strong as i'm wanting it to be right now and i couldn't put my finger on it and it was yeah. because my finale at that point wasn't about me right um, at and that point I was doing something and I had another person on stage and stuff like that and so I would finish and then that person still had to leave yep. and then you have to get another bell and it was and it was really weird how me asking that one question of him right. put my whole finale right. and why it wasn't working into complete perspective for me yeah, and I was able to change it and go like obviously and it's taking what he his thought process behind that routine you didn't just go well I guess I gotta close with silks to you know right. silks out of mouth or whatever it was what, that same thing like you said what makes that joke work i'm not going to do someone else's joke but i can apply that to my to my jokes you and know the, applying and, that to his it's and like, the okay. math of it still works. you know what i mean exactly like, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's like so now how can i come up with a finale that doesn't have an audience member on stage that is more focused and about me it's not a prop or anything how can i do and so right now i'm actually playing with uh dean dill's explosion yeah uh it's because gonna kill it's more room. of a focused kind of more of a small and it's all about me single yeah. spot kind of thing well and it so ties in with you starting off with doing close-up right and, talk about yeah. the close-up magic at the start and everything so it also bookends that nicely so oh, that's great and man. all that came about just from me asking Jonathan because I was really curious. Yeah. I was like, it's because a lot of times you hear, you know, always end with your biggest trick or your strongest trick. Right. And, so, and I was always taught that growing up. And I was looking at a show going, he doesn't do that, but he well, gets such a great reaction. I wonder why. Magicians have, uh, we for years have made the mistake of having people remember the trick and not remember the performer. Right. And what you're saying right now is one of the keys to having people walk away and remember the experience they had with you. They didn't just go, we saw this guy and he made a, you know, a table float. <laughs> you know right. what I mean? Like, and that's actually one of the things that you and I had really in common. I mean, you've seen my show, my show, 70% of it is me telling stories about right. my childhood, me being a dancer shows that I've been in. It's talking about, you know, my very, uh, first crush and right. the kiss we had and yeah. just these weird intimate little stories. But because of that, my whole philosophy is when people leave, I don't care if they like the show. I don't care if they like the magic. There's right. a lot of people that'll come to a show and they don't like magic. Right. Uh, they're coming because their kids, their wife, things like that. All I want is them to leave and say, I like him. Yeah. Even if you don't like magic. Yeah. It's like, you know what? I feel like I got to know him. Yep. I heard all these funny stories. I connected with them. So That's when so they good, leave, man. you know, my whole philosophy is like the show, don't like the show. Just leave and like me. Uh, just, just be like, I, I like him. And mm -hmm. I do really well with Yelp and things like that. And a lot of that is because it's a connection thing. You right. want them to like, I want them to like me. I can care less if they like the magic. Yeah. I, years ago, I used to say that I wanted people to afterward go, I want to go grab a beer with this guy. And now That's my a great analogy. Now yeah. my new, my new thought process is I want to, I want people to leave and feel like they just did. Like they already, we just already connected. Like we just had this great time together. You know what I mean? And that or I want to set them up with my 24-year-old daughter. Either one of those. Either one of those. <laughs> That's fantastic, man. <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> you know, my, my buddy Mark James, who's been on the program before, he, uh, he lives in England. And his, he told me the other day, I was having a stress, stressed out moment about this corporate gig. And like, I didn't know how it was going to go. And I was all anxious. And he's like, bro, just realize someone's about to see your show. And all you have to do is think of two people that are in the audience. There's someone who's going to see their first magic show in your audience, and there's someone who's going to see your last, their last magic show in your audience. Well, that's morbidly. Isn't it right? <laughs> so, so then I just pick out who it is. I'm like, Sarah, it's you. <laughs> follow, follow the light. Follow the light. <laughs> Enjoy it while it lasts, sir.
<laughs> six card repeat, yeah. you're probably going to wish it was 12 cards. <laughs> know, right? Do the 21 card trick. Make it last. Buddy, this has been awesome. Thank oh, you for doing this. Man. It was We've a got lot of fun. five minutes till doors open. We should probably oh. clean up our microphones here. And- <laughs> uh, sh- all right, to we'll, heck with it. Let the audience in on the show. Right. We'll just do a Q&A. Welcome, guys. Welcome to the first live uh, about to break from the loft. <laughs> that would be fun. Next, next, next week up, live Let's do it. from the loft, Let's Q&A. Do it. We'll Absolutely. Do live from That'll the be loft. fun. I like that. I love that. We'll okay. do it. We'll do it in November. We'll do live from the loft. Right? Okay. Sounds good. All right, guys. Well, we're going to go talk more about that idea over sushi. But first, we got to do a magic show. So... Thanks so much, guys. Go check out Robert. Uh, if you're listening right now, go to the show notes. I'll put links to his website and social and all that stuff so that you can go. Now I have to finish putting together the website. <laughs> all right, guys. Bye-bye. <laughs>